Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. The Omohundro Institute created the OI Reader because it has been thinking about the future of historical scholarship. The OI Reader is a distinctive app that allows scholars to integrate all types of digital media into their publications and gives readers the ability to read and interact with multimedia content. One of the scholars who is working with the OI to pioneer this new type of historical scholarship is our friend from episode 66, Simon Newman. Simon is working on a project about Jamaican slaves who ran away during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. He's using his research to write a new type of scholarly article that uses text, maps, music, video, and other sounds to give us an interactive and three-dimensional picture of the runaway slaves and the Jamaica they lived in. I asked Simon to tell us what his new article will look like if it's published and why he turned to the Omohundro Institute and the OI Reader to help him realize his vision. This isn't just about adding some flashy bells and whistles to an academic journal article. It's about using different kinds of media and evidence in order to enhance comprehension and analysis. It's to support an argument. It's to suggest that by listening, by viewing video and these sorts of things, we can actually understand the past in a different way. We can perhaps recreate experience and recreate things about how people understood their environment in ways that are much more difficult to do with just text. What you'll see is a great many more images and maps, you'll probably see three-dimensional topographical mapping. It will show how the landscape of 18th century Jamaica looked, the contours, and you'll be able to do a sort of fly-through and see what a journey through it would have been like, the different kinds of environments, and then start populating them. You'll also see things like video scenes with 18th century images integrated into them, recordings of music and people speaking to give a sense of the sound of a very African 18th century Jamaican society. And all of this will be integrated. So much of it will sort of occur. If you turn a page, you might see an image and a recording would start. I wanted to do this initially with the Omohundro Institute and with the OI Reader because I realized that having downloaded the OI Reader onto my tablet, I saw how the potential was here. And I know of no other journal that has developed this kind of technology yet. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 105 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Over the last nine months, the Doing History, How Historians Work series has allowed us to conduct a fairly in-depth investigation into how historians work. Since January, we've explored why historians study the past, how they choose and research their topics, and how they organize and write about their research. But what do historians do with their research once they finish writing about it? How does historians' writing become the history books and articles we love to read? Today, we're going to investigate how historians publish their writing about history. Joshua Piker, a professor of history at the College of William & Mary and the editor of the William & Mary Quarterly, will serve as our guide through the world of history publications. During our conversation, Josh reveals an overview of why historians view history as a process, different publication opportunities for historians, and how publication fits within the process of history, and a behind-the-scenes look at what it takes to publish in the premier journal of early American history and culture, the William & Mary Quarterly. Are you ready to find out more about how historians publish the books and articles we love to read? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a professor of history at the College of William & Mary and the editor of the William & Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history and culture. In addition to overseeing the publication of journal articles, he has published two books, Okfuski, A Creek Town in Colonial America, and The Four Deaths of Acorn Whistler, Telling Stories in Colonial America. Given his expertise as both a published author and a journal editor, he joins us for our Doing History, How Historians Work series to explore how historians publish history. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Joshua Piker. Thank you, Liz. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Over the course of the Doing History series, we've explored how historians research and write about history. But before we dive into how historians publish their research, we should really talk about how most historians view history as a process. Josh, would you tell us why many historians view history as a process and what they mean by history as a process? Well, Liz, I think that historians tend to mean two things by history as a process. First and most generally, they're talking about patterns and they're talking about trajectories, the ways in which historical time unfolds, the connections between peoples and events here and peoples and events there, experiences here, experiences there. But the second thing that historians often mean when they talk about the process of history is the process of doing history, how we investigate the past how we think about what we find as we investigate the past and how we communicate what it is we've discovered, right? How we disseminate the information, how we publish it, how we talk about it. Publications must play a really important role in the process of history as their primary purpose is to communicate history. So what are the different types of publication options that historians use to communicate their work? There's all sorts of ways to communicate our knowledge of the past, right? And no one way is necessarily better than the other. You can have a podcast, you can give talks, you can participate in social media, you can have your own website and your own blog, or you can publish your material, right? And most people who are interested in the past who wind up wanting to talk in the broadest sense about what they found and what they think it means, most people wind up doing some or all of the above. In terms of publication options, the range has expanded dramatically since I was in graduate school. I got my PhD in 1998. And, you know, at this point, you have an almost endless buffet of options in front of you as you seek to reach the audience you want to reach with your insights about the past. You can certainly publish in one of the more, you know, mainstream old line journals like the Way of Mary Quarterly or like the Journal of American History. There are more specialized journals that focus on the history of a particular era or the particular region or a particular event like, say, the American Revolution. And all of those are print journals that have online components, of course, but there are also a wide array of websites that publish really first-class scholarship, long form, short form, that are available to specialists in the field, but also to people who want to contribute to a conversation about a particular issue, a particular topic, but don't necessarily have the training as a scholar. We often hear historians and readers divide history books, articles, websites, even podcasts into categories of popular and scholarly history. Would you tell us about these different types of history publications and what makes them different from each other? I should start by saying that, you know, right up front, I don't love the dichotomy popular versus scholarly. You're completely right to say that this is how we discuss them, and I discuss them myself in that way. But I tend to think of the publication world as a spectrum, not as you're reaching one group of readers or another group of readers. And so if we think about publications as a continuum, right, you can start from the most general basic sorts of history to the most specialized sorts of history. And most scholars wind up somewhere on that continuum at some points in their career. And I think the key thing that separates, you know, a particular work that you're doing at that particular moment is the question of whose voice is in your head, right? Who are you writing for? If you're writing for a very small subset of people, right, who are highly trained and highly focused on one particular issue, then of course you're writing for, you know, academic historians or scholarly audience. If you're writing for a sort of a broader range of people, though, that could include academics, that could include general readers who have some training in history and might do some history themselves. It might just include someone who picked up your work off a bookshelf at the local bookstore or the local library library or saw it online and wanted to read a chapter of it. So you're almost inevitably, unless you're truly setting out to reach a very small group of people, you're almost inevitably writing for what we would think of as a popular audience at some point in your career. And so if you get back to that question that I just mentioned, you know, whose voice is in your head, what do you want your work to do, right? Who do you want to speak to? Who do you want to be influenced by this work? And what effect do you want it to have? If I want to introduce my topic, in my research to a wide range of people that I'm going to write in a particular way, right? I might work to foreground the narrative. I might work to foreground character. I might, you know, develop the story of a particular individual. If I'm going to write for a more scholarly audience, you know, sort of a small group of people who I know are already predisposed to be interested in this topic, then I don't necessarily have to do any of that. And I can focus more on the 
the sort of minutia of my findings, and I can focus more on the debates between scholars. But, you know, again and again and again, I think as historians, professional and non-professional, we tend to fall somewhere on that spectrum. We're very rarely writing just for specialists or just for generalists. So those categories are really about audience and not about whether a book or article is well-researched. It's really about who we want to reach with our writing. That's an excellent point. It is true that if you want to reach a scholarly audience, if the voices in your head are more the voices of scholars, you will need to double down on the research. You will need to make sure you have your research ducks in a row. If you're writing for an audience of generalists or non-specialists or you know a more public audience, that sort of impetus to make sure your research is letter perfect may not be as pronounced. On the other hand, I would say that if you're really truly committed to you know the process of doing history, to get back to your first question, if you really want want to dive into the past, want to explore it, want to emerge with something worthwhile to say to people, you're going to make sure your research is pretty darn good to begin with. Now, Josh is the editor of the William & Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history and culture. Josh, would you tell us about the William & Mary Quarterly and how it fits within the world of publication opportunities that we've been discussing? So the quarterly is very much a scholarly journal. You know, we're housed in a university, we're housed in the Umhundra Institute, which is the leading institute for the study of early American history. It's edited by an academic, there are academics on staff, a lot of our readership is academic. So on the one hand, we're very much on the scholarly end of that continuum that I talked about. On the other hand, we are very committed at the journal to expanding the reach of the scholarship that we publish. You know, we want to publish first-class scholarship. We want it to reach a wide audience. And in part, that's due to the nature of the field that we publish in. So the Waymary Quarterly is a journal of early American history and culture. And if you think about the sort of the core terms there, early American history and culture, each of those is a very, very broad term. So early American history, you know, it used to be 1607 to 1789. But over the last generation or two, the early part of early American history has come to encompass pre-Columbian work all the way up through, you know, we go to the 1820s or 1830s. So that's a, you know, a 500-year sweep of early. That's a lot of different people you need to write for if you want to publish in the quarterly. And the same with American, right? The word American in that title. American used to mean the 13 colonies. Well, we're still very interested in the 13 colonies, but American has now come to encompass the entire continent of North America and related developments in the Caribbean, in what we call the Atlantic world, the basin that links North America, South America, America, Africa, and Europe. And early Americanists are now moving into the global sphere as we trace the implications of early American life out into the world. So again, that's very broad in history, right? The final word in our title, early American history, history itself is no longer just done by historians, and I think very productively so. So if you're writing in the quarterly, you're writing for not just historians, but for scholars and generalists who have come to the subject of the early American past from a variety of different disciplinary perspectives. And because of all of that, so we are a scholarly journal, but because of the breadth of the field that we're publishing in, early American history, because of that, the authors of our articles are constantly sort of reaching out to other audiences, to non-specialists. And so if you're writing about you know, Cotton Mather's experience with Nibibit, well, you can't just say I'm going to be writing for only people who are interested in Cotton Mather or only people who are interested in Puritan New England. You have to make your topic relevant to the sort of people who read the journal. The Quarterly is a journal for scholars and for specialists, but it's also very much accessible to academic generalists and to, I would say, the general public who have, you know, a willingness to invest a little bit of time in diving into an essay. You mentioned that history is no longer done by just historians. Do you have to have a PhD in history to publish in a journal like the William & Mary Quarterly? Not at all. I don't ask for people's backgrounds when they send me an essay. I want to publish the best scholarship in my field, and I don't particularly care who's done it, you know, who's written it, what your training is. I will ask for your institutional affiliation just because I need your email address. So no, not at all. And not everyone who publishes in the quarterly has a PhD, and not everyone who has a PhD has a PhD in history. And so the journal is very much open to the best scholarship in the field, full stop. The identities of the authors don't really matter at all in the evaluation process. You also noted that the Quarterly is a scholarly journal, that it's housed at the College of William & Mary in the Omohundro Institute, and that scholars work on the journal. That doesn't really sound all that unusual for a scholarly journal about history. 
How does the William & Mary Quarterly differ from other history journals? In part, we differ from other journals in terms of our sort of expansive sense of who we're publishing for, right? I mean, I'm not going to say we're the only journal that's trying to reach out to generalists or we're the only journal that's hoping to attract, you know, non-academic readership, because certainly there are other journals that are aiming to do that. But most don't. Most academic journals don't see themselves as having that kind of mandate, and we do. But the other thing that distinguishes the quarterly from most other journals is the sort of level of staffing that we have. Have, the amount of sort of concentrated expertise we can bring to bear on any given article or any given issue. I have, you know, for a journal, a fairly large staff working under me. So we have multiple copy editors and a managing editor. We have a book review editor. This year we have eight or nine, I think, people we call apprentices who are essentially fact checkers. And so when you send an essay to the quarterly and it enters the publication process, the article is going to be worked over very heavily by a range of of, you know, professional editors and each statement of fact in each citation you have in the article will be fact checked. And so when your essay is finally published, your prose will be as polished as it can be. Your argument will be as strong as it can be given the evidence you have and your evidence will be checked. So make sure that you're saying what you want to say with the evidence that supports it. And so part of what sets the quarterly apart from most other journals is the degree of labor that we, the staff of the quarterly, we call it team quarterly, the amount of of labor the team quarterly puts into every essay and every issue is one of the things that really truly sets us apart from other journals. Josh, you've opened the door and we're sneaking a peek behind the scenes of the William & Mary Quarterly. Why don't we open this door further? Would you tell us about your job as editor of the quarterly? What exactly do you do as editor of a history journal? The quarterly is and has been, you know, since time immemorial, as far as I can tell, is a very editor focused journal. There are all sorts of ways to run a journal. You can have a plural editorship or you can have a very involved editorial board. At the quarterly, everything centers on the editor. And because we self publish, the editor oversees every aspect of production from the moment an essay arrives, you know, at our doorstep to really post production, post publication as we work on getting readership or our authors, all of that is in my bailiwick. And so that means that I wind up dealing with things that I never thought I would have to deal with, you know, hiring and firing typesetters or printers, deciding whether we should ship out a hard copy of our journal in paper or plastic. That's in my strike zone, apparently. But most of my job, the vast majority of my job is focused on the actual evaluation of article manuscripts that come in and the time that I spend working with the authors who write those pieces. And I'm able to do that because the staff I have is so very, very good. So we have a stable of apprentices, the fact checkers I mentioned. Well, they're overseen by Meg Musselwhite, who is our managing editor, who has got an MA in history. She's a William Mary grad. She was an apprentice herself at one point, and she's spectacular. And so like in theory, I oversee the apprentices, but actually Meg oversees the apprentices. And so I can devote the vast majority of my time to the actual scholarship that we publish. It kind of sounds like you're a modern day Ben Franklin, Josh. <laughs> I had not thought of that. I'm going to need to take a minute to get my mind around that analogy. Uh, go on. Well, I just mean that your job sounds a lot like the job that Ben Franklin performed when he worked as a printer. Franklin had to manage his print shop, set type, oversee apprentices. Plus, he had to manage the content for his Pennsylvania Gazette, print it, and get his newspaper out into the world. I mean, that's essentially the job you just described. Yeah, that's exactly right. I am Ben Franklin. I truly hadn't thought of that, and I'm flattered by the analogy. There is something to that, sort of to surface from comparing me to, you know, one of our founding fathers. Part of the process of production at the quarterly, it's very much a colonial American process, right? It's very hands-on. It's very labor-intensive. And we, the staff who works here, are all very specialized and very trained, but we do a wide range of things. And so it's not like the production process is broken down in to a series of sort of automated steps. We are producing sort of an artisanal product, I guess would be one way to look at it if you want to compare it to Franklin. We are not mass producing things. Let's go even further behind the scenes. Would you take us through your publication process? Say we send you an essay. How does our essay go from essay to published article? The essay arrives. It is entered into our system by Kelly Crawford, our office manager, and she gets it onto my desk. And I evaluate every essay that comes in. We get between 100 and 120 a year. 
and I evaluate whether the essay is appropriate for the journal. And if it is appropriate for the journal and if it clears a certain bar, which I'm happy to talk about, then I send it out for what's called peer review. That is, I send the article out to five or so scholars who will evaluate the piece and send me a report. Each of them will send me a report. Once those reports come back in, and I give the readers, we call them, I give the readers, the peer reviewers, three months to get me their reports. Once the reports come back in, I look over the reports, I read over the essay again, I decide whether the essay should be accepted for publication whether it should be rejected with the option for resubmission, or whether it should simply be rejected. And then I write a fairly detailed four or five page single space letter to the author explaining what I see in the reports and my decision. And at that point, say the essay has been accepted, at that point, the author will have to go back and even if it's an accepted piece and make some changes because he or she has just received the feedback from myself, but most especially from the five readers. And then they send the final essay back to me. I copy edit it. I send it to Meg Musselwhite, the managing editor, and either Meg or Carol Arnett, Meg's assistant editor, copy edit it further. It goes to fact checking. And then once it's fact checked and the copy edited by either Carol and Meg and myself, we send it back to the author to make the changes that are called for in the copy editing and fact checking process. They send it back to us. We review it to make sure the changes are acceptable. Then it goes to the typesetter. Once we get the material back from the typesetter, it's called page proofs at that point. We then go over the page proofs. Again, I edit them. Either Carol or Meg edit them. They go back to the author. They send it back to us. There's usually a couple rounds of that until finally it's ready to be published. Wow. That's quite a process. And it leaves us with so many questions. Earlier, you mentioned that there's a bar for publication and that you'd tell us about it. So, Josh, spill the beans. (laughs) <laughs> what is your bar for publication? Well, yes, there is a bar for publication, but the first bar that an essay has to clear is not whether it will be published, because I've yet to see a submission that was letter perfect and I knew I wanted to publish. So the first bar that an essay needs to clear is whether it should go out for peer review. And what I look for when I'm evaluating a new submission, when I'm trying to figure out whether it should go out for peer review, is actually fairly simple. You know, I look to see if it's reasonably well written. Is there a coherent structure and a coherent argument? I look to see if there's solid primary source based research, because that's what we publish. We publish articles that are grounded in a mastery of the necessary primary sources. And I look to see whether there's what we call historiographical engagement, right? Is the author engaging? with other scholars who have written about a related topic or the same topic, right? Is the author, in a sense, reaching out to that wide audience of early Americanists and taking the time to explain why her work matters, right? If I see those three things in the essay, then I'm delighted to send it out for peer review. In general, it's the third thing that trips up authors. In general, people have good research and the essay is well-written, but again and again and again, I see people not reaching out, right? Not engaging with the historiography not telling us explicitly how their findings, how their research relates to what's been done in the past, right? What other historians have said about related topics. And so that's the first bar. You noted that you send articles out to peer review if they pass this first bar. But what is peer review? Peer review is at the center of what we do. You know, it's sort of the beating heart of this journal. Peer review is a process by which other scholars evaluate your work they tell you what's working and what's not, and they try to help you make your work better. And that, you know, it's very simple, you know, just to say it that way, but that's really at the heart of peer review. And so what peer review is in terms of my daily life is peer review means that if you send me an essay on Ben Franklin, I will try to find five scholars who have written about a related topic, right? Written about Ben Franklin or whatever aspect of Ben Franklin's life that you're writing about. And I will send them the essay. They will not know the identity of the author and you will never know the identity of the readers unless they reveal their identity to you. It's what's called double blind peer review. Say to them, you don't know the identity of this author. Just evaluate this piece. Tell me what's working. Tell me what's not and give me some suggestions for how to fix it. And that is sort of the essence of the peer review process. And so the readers, what they send back to me is what we call a reader's report. And a reader's report varies from, in my two plus years in the job, I've seen reports ranging from one sentence to 11 single space type pages. In general, a reader's report is two to three single space pages. And the most effective reader's reports are the ones that make an argument, that acknowledge what the author has done, that describe in sort of, you know, fairly argumentative terms sometimes what's working, right, and what's not, and at the end try to diagnose or suggest some ways for the author to move. 
Readers' reports can be very critical. Readers' reports can be very supportive. But the process of getting feedback from other scholars, then having that feedback in front of you, as well as my reaction to the feedback into your essay, that process is, I think, absolutely essential to producing first-class scholarship. Because there's only so much you can see as an author, right? There's only so much you can see about your own work. There's only so much you can read in primary sources or in the published literature. You need to have the input of other scholars. And a large chunk of my job is sort of riding herd on that process, introducing, in a sense, authors to readers and readers to authors and mediating the conversation that happens between them. It seems curious that this whole peer review process is anonymous because it's like a judgment process. And in the United States, if you're going to be judged in the eyes of the law, you have a right to face those who judge and accuse you. What is the logic of having a double blind peer review process? It's an interesting and fraught question, and there are people who feel very strongly that it should not be anonymous. And they note, as does sometimes happen, that anonymity can give people you know, a cloak to behave badly. And we see this all the time. You just have to look at the comment section of any blog post, right? You know, It doesn't take long if someone's not mediating the blog to have the comments be generated in name calling. The logic behind allowing peer reviewers to remain anonymous is that then they can tell you what they really think then they have the ability to say, I don't know who this author is. He or she may be powerful. He or she may not be powerful. He or she may be he or she. I am simply evaluating the work and the scholar whose evaluation I'm providing does not know who I am. And therefore, I don't have to worry about power relations. Therefore, I don't have to worry about how this process affects my own work. I can simply focus on what the author has written and what's working here and what's not working. Now, having said that, does the process work all of the time? No, it does not. It works 99% of the time. I think I've probably seen 800, 900 readers' reports in the last couple of years. If memory serves, there have been two that I thought crossed the line between sort of critique and abuse. So the vast majority of scholars take this process very seriously, and they provide serious, sustained, usable critique for the authors whose work we're evaluating. And the other thing that needs to be said is that the anonymity for both the author and the readers only works if the editor of whatever journal you're talking about is really engaged in the process. The editors really need to spend some time, if this process is going to work, picking the right people, picking people who are not connected to the author, picking people who are qualified to evaluate the author's work. And the editor also needs to spend some time mediating between author and readers. The editor needs to make sure that if there's you know, abuse, that it's filtered out, that it doesn't go to the author. The editor needs to push the readers if the readers are not responding appropriately. So if the editor is paying attention, there's sort of a regulating mechanism built into the process. But I am a big believer that anonymity is an important part of the process. If a reader wants to reveal his or her identity, that's fine with me. If they've chosen to do that, that's absolutely fine. But I want the readers to know that they can tell me what they think of the piece and that they can do so without having to worry about repercussions. And that's what anonymity is for. Peer review sounds incredibly important. And we've been talking about how you use it at the William & Mary Quarterly and how other journal editors use it too. Do book publishers also use peer review? Academic presses use peer review. Presses that are publishing for a non-academic audience, sometimes use peer review and sometimes do not, is my understanding. I've never actually published with one of those presses, but that's my understanding. My sense is that, and here I'm at the ragged edge of my knowledge because I'm not in the book publishing business, my sense is that Journals at the level of the Women Mary Quarterly tend to seek out more readers. I try to get five readers for any given article. I think with books, you get usually two readers' reports. And those reports, of course, tend to be more in-depth, but then the reports that I get from many readers are quite in-depth. So book publishers do use peer review, and for the same reasons that I've described, right? That, you know, you need, as an author, you need feedback from people to help you improve your work. And as a publisher, you need feedback from other specialists because you can't possibly be an expert in every aspect of the field that you're publishing in. And so you need people who are experts to tell you what's working and what's not. Given its importance to the publication of the history books and articles we like to read, let's look more closely at the process of peer review. In August 2016, William & Mary Quarterly author Kirsten Fisher published a post about her experience with peer review on the Omohundro Institute's blog, Uncommon Sense. Josh, would you tell us about Kirsten's William & Mary Quarterly article? 
I love that post and I love that article. The article is a tremendously interesting piece and reading the blog post and having a chance to sort of look over Kirsten's shoulder as she reflects about the publication process I found to be enormously illuminating. The article is called Vitalism in Early America. I don't even know how to pronounce the guy's name. Elihu Palmer's Radical Religion in the Early Republic. And Fisher here is writing about a man who was out on, again, the ragged edge of religious thought in the decades after the American Revolution. Palmer was a trained minister who had a sort of the opposite of a come to Jesus moment, in essence, who lost his faith in the Protestant denomination he was trained in and became one of the many sort of free thinking radicals in the post-revolutionary era. And Kirsten Fisher is interested in Palmer, not because he changed the world necessarily, because he didn't. He was moderately famous in the 1790s and early 1800s. Infamous might be a better term, but you know, he is just one of the thinkers out there who's sort of pushing the edge of early American religious thought. And there's a booming interest in early American history in the issue of religion in especially the revolutionary era, its importance or lack thereof, and in many more you know, nuanced versions of those questions. And what Fisher wants to do with Palmer is to help us understand essentially the limits of radical thought that we're used to thinking about people like, you know, Diaz, people like Tom Paine, for example, as being out there on the fringe. Well, Palmer, in terms of his views of what we'd call spirituality or his views of how the world worked, was very, very far on the radical fringe from even someone like Tom Paine. Palmer believed, Fisher shows, that there was this vitalist principle, this sort of shared force that emanated through all of us, and that if we just learned about the force and we just learned to recognize what we all shared, we would learn essentially to, you know, to end war, to end slavery, to end hierarchy. He saw the vitalist principles that he believed motivated human beings and structured the universe. He saw these principles as absolutely essential for the proper reformation of the American society. You know, because he's involved in that process of reforming the American society, he's very much involved in the conversations that were critical for the American Republic in the years after the American Revolution. So that's what Fisher's talking about. It's a wonderful piece. Now, when you discussed the peer review process, you mentioned reader reports. And in her blog post, Kirsten described that she received several different reader reports about the submission that became her article. Would you tell us about reader reports? What do they look like and what sorts of information do they contain? In essence, a good reader's report is an argument. I ask the readers not to sort of copy edit a manuscript. If they want to copy edit a manuscript, they want to give me a long list of all the grammatical flaws. That's fine. They're doing my job for me. But what I really want them to do is evaluate the argument and the evidence and the presentation of both. And so a good reader's report will start by laying out what the author is trying to accomplish and the nature of his or her research base. You'll then go into you know, what's working and what's not, what's successful and what's not, and with some suggestions for moving forward. Now, one of the things to say about reader's reports is that, you know, of course, they come from scholars with different varieties of expertise. So in terms of Kirsten Fisher's essay, right, I couldn't just send it to five scholars. I wouldn't just send it to five scholars who are experts on Elihu Palmer, partly because I don't think there are five scholars who are experts on Palmer. But more than that, I want the piece evaluated by a reader pool that reflects the sort of audience that Kirsten was aiming to reach when she sent her piece to the quarterly. And so when I pick out a group of readers for a given essay, I want some of them to be specialists. I want some of them to be generalists. We could think, I guess, about sort of three different baskets of readers for any given essays. There'll be specialists in you know the place in the, the period that the author is writing about. And so so, you know, for Kirsten, that would be specialists in the early republic in the United States. There would also be specialists in the theme that the authors were writing about. And so for Kirsten, I obviously want to send the essay to specialists in religious history, right? Especially people who are working in sort of free thinking and radicalism and varieties of unbelief. And finally, the final basket would be generalists, right? I will always try to find a reader or two who is not, in Kirsten's case, a specialist in the early republic or simply focused on radical free thought. I want to find someone who is a specialist in early American history and should, I think, be interested in this particular article, but who is not a person who has written on this topic before. Because that's in part who you're trying to reach when you publish in a journal like The Quarterly. This gets back to that continuum that I talked about at the beginning. If you just want to publish for 
specialists in the early republic who focus on religion, to get back to Kirsten's topic, don't send that essay to me. There are journals that you could publish that in, and that would be a significant contribution to the process of doing history. But if you want to publish in the quarterly, you need to be able to take your focus on, in this case, the religious history of the early republic and radical free thought and make it relevant to a wider audience. And I want to make sure in each reader pool that I assemble, that I have somebody who can evaluate that aspect of the process. And so for Kirsten, you know, that meant someone who is sort of a more general interest in sort of the transatlantic circulation of ideas about the nature of people's relationship to the universe and to the divine, and not someone who is necessarily an early Americanist per se. Kirsten mentioned that her fourth reader, Reader D, went to great lengths to refute the argument she had made about Palmer. She found this frustrating, but in the end, she also admitted that Reader D's critique made her article stronger. Josh, would you tell us how authors like Kirsten use the feedback they receive from peer reviewers to make their articles better? So the analogy that I like to think about is to consider the process of an author interacting with, in this case, her readers as a dinner party. The author sends an essay to me and says, essentially, who should we invite over to talk about this piece? And I will come up with five people who I think we should talk with about this piece. And then the readers and the author and I will have a conversation. Now, it's not your typical dinner party, of course, because, you know, the author of the piece can't actually be introduced to the guests and the guests don't know the identity of the author and the guests also can't talk to each other. But there's still a process there of conversation. And when you have an essay like Kirsten, and we have a set of readers' reports, like she had, and particularly the report from Reader D, which was incredibly involved and incredibly detailed. And the reader went back to Kirsten's source material. She calls him him, let's call him him, for his own purposes, investigated Kirsten's conclusions and came up with his own conclusions based on what he found in that source material. When you have something like that and you have that kind of in-depth conversation, you as an author have a chance to really figure out what's working and what's not in your piece and how you can fix it. And so a lot large chunk of what I try to do with authors is get them to sort of step back from their own work and step back from their feelings about the reports. Kirsten says she was frustrated with Reader D and I don't blame her at all, right? It's incredibly daunting to have somebody engage with your work at that level and decide, you know, on balance, I think you're wrong. Right? But I try to get authors to step back from that to figure out what they can take from the critique that they've gotten, how they can improve their work. And if they think that the critique is wrong, how you can diffuse that critique, how you can prevent that sort of reading of your work in the future. And so for Kirsten, if I remember correctly, part of what she did was modify her presentation of Palmer's thought, because that was the essence of Reader D's critique. And part of what she did was find ways throughout her presentation of earlier aspects of Palmer's life to diffuse critiques of the sort that Reader D was presenting her with. And so you think about the process from an author's perspective. You're making your work stronger when you can. You know, you're firming up your argument. You're changing it as necessary. But you're also finding ways to inoculate yourself against criticism, to say, look, I know you might think this, but really I've already thought of that and here's why you're wrong. You can't just say that to a reader, of course, but there are ways you can build those sorts of qualifiers in to an essay. And that's a large chunk of what you do in the peer review process. It's really amazing to hear about the publication process. You mentioned that you have a staff that invests time and energy into making sure that each essay you publish is on the best footing possible. You have authors who read peer review reports and then set about to improve their work. And let's not even forget about the time and effort peer reviewers put in to help authors who they may or may not know. It just sounds like each article has a ton of man and woman hours invested in them. Do you know how many working hours go into a typical article? And how long does the entire process take from submission to publication? As it happens, I can quantify the number of hours, you know, relatively speaking, fairly precisely. My colleague and the director of the institute that I work for, Karen Wolf, went back and counted the number of hours we spent on an essay that we published a few years back. And she came up with 130 man hours for that essay. And that's just our staff, right? That does not count the time that the readers put in. And of course, it doesn't count the time the authors put in. The readers' time, I should say, you know, it's volunteer labor. They're not paid for any of this. The staff at the Institute is, in fact, paid. So we spend, you know, an enormous amount of 
of time on every essay that we work on. And that's true for me for the essays, whether we publish them or not. In the end, the quarterly has long rejected between 85 and 90 percent of the essays that are submitted to the journal. But each of those essays is rejected, gets a, you know, a letter from me. Most of them get four or five readers' reports. So even the material that we don't publish gets a great deal of feedback and a great deal of critique, which I hope and expect helps the author improve their work, even if he or she is not publishing in the quarterly. But you know, if you submit an essay and it goes all the way through the process and it is finally published, we will spend somewhere between 100 and 150 hours on your essay, depending on length and such. In terms of how long the process takes for an author, I've worked very hard to try to reduce the time from submission to publication. In my ideal world, you will submit an essay, I will get it out to the readers within a week or two, and I will have a decision letter back to you within about three months of the date of submission. At that point, sort of the clock on my end stops, right? Because at that point, it's up to you, the author. Let's say you have a revise and resubmit. Well, some authors take a year or two to revise and resubmit, depending on the nature of the changes and the demands on their time. Some authors are able to turn the piece around very quickly. If you get the piece back to me in a month or two, I'll send it out to peer review again if it's a revise and resubmit. It'll go through that process again. Usually the second round is quicker. And then I'll give you an up or down decision. And let's say it's an acceptance. Once you get the final draft to me, in general, I've got about a six-month queue of things that are ready to be published. So you would have to wait six, eight months to see it in print. Does the journal publication process play any role in the publication process for the history books that we love to read? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There are a couple different ways that a journal article can relate to a history book. Sometimes the journal article is sort of a dry run for the book, either for a chapter of the book or for the larger book that you're publishing. It's a chance for you to try out some of your material, to get feedback on it, and to let people know that the book project is coming. And Kirsten Fisher's piece is a great example. She's got this much larger project about the people surrounding Palmer and about the intellectual milieu in which she was participating. And so her article sort of functions as a way to let us know that that material is coming. And thanks to Reader D to get lots and lots of feedback and to improve the book that will come. Another way that a journal article, though, can relate to a book is the journal article could grow out of a book project. The material that you want to publish in the journal article might not entirely work for that particular book project. And so uh, to use an example of my own scholarship, you mentioned my second book, The Four Deaths of Acorn Whistler, Telling Stories in Early America. Well, I published that in 2013. I published an article from that project in 2011. And that article was called Lying Together, The Imperial Implications of Cross-Cultural Untruths. And it's all about Acorn Whistler. It's all about why Acorn Whistler had to die, which is the central question behind the book. But in the article, I wanted to investigate lies, not stories. You know, lies is a brand of stories, but I wanted to talk about lies and why people lie and what it meant when people on both sides of the Indian-European frontier tell the same lie. And that wasn't something I could really do in the book. And so I spun that piece off into an article and it allowed me to investigate issues that were related to the book, but that were not central to the book's topic and therefore that I couldn't discuss there. We've just had an awesome behind the scenes tour of the William and Mary Quarterly. And I think when many of us picture what this journal looks like, we picture a small printed book like publication. But before we move into the time warp, Josh, would you tell us about the Quarterly's digital counterpart? the OI Reader. How does this tablet app complement the William & Mary Quarterly, and how does it add a digital dimension to this traditionally printed journal? Yeah, I'd love to talk about the OI Reader. We're very excited about it. We published it in 2014, and we had significant help from Adobe with the technology and with the designing of the app. And it lives on your tablet, your iOS, Android tablet, and it allows you to read the quarterly on your tablet as if you're reading it in print form. So the pages look exactly like, you know, it's better because they're digitally enhanced, exactly like the print form of the journal. But what's so exciting about the OI Reader as an app is it allows authors to do an enormous amount with digital materials. And so we've had authors embed sound bites, you know, little links, the sound clips in their articles. We've had authors develop interactive maps. We've had authors present interactive pictures. We've had authors present not just, you know, one picture or two pictures, but a whole range of images that can be presented in color and that the readers can really focus in on. And so it allows authors to do a great deal more with sort of supplemental digital material. And that's what it does right now. My hope is that the field of early American history, now that 
we have this tool now that an article can live you know, on your tablet in a very advanced form, that scholars will start thinking about new ways to publish their material. As of this moment, what we're doing with the app is supplemental. My hope is that we'll soon be able to publish some articles that use digital material as the fundamental basis of the article and then spin off from that the more historiographical sorts of things that we do in the quarterly. And so I'm working with an author right now on a piece that's about runaway slaves in Jamaica. The article itself will be structured around sort of a tour through Jamaica and that the experience of moving through Jamaica will be central to your experience of reading the article and that you will, you know, encounter sights and sounds. He wants smells. I don't think we're going to get smells just yet, but you know that this will be a much richer experience of Jamaican slavery and the experience of the runaways than we could ever do in the print pages of a journal. And the OI Reader is available on your tablets and you can download it for free at either the App Store or the Google Play Store. It's a pretty exciting new digital dimension to the quarterly. It's one of the things that sets us apart from other journals. There really is no one else who has an app like this. We're really very, very eager to see what our colleagues make of it. And that's actually a perfect segue into the time warp. Normally, this is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. However, I've gone ahead and pulled our time machine out of the garage so Josh can use it to tell us about the future. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Josh, in your opinion, what will the landscape of publication opportunities look like for historians 25 and 50 years from now? Will printed books and journals be dead? Will historians still publish history in the written word? I think it's an excellent question. A couple things. One is that it's pretty clear to me that the sort of chicken little, the roof is falling on print media has been overblown. We will almost certainly still have print media 25 years from now. And that over the course of the remainder 20 years of my career or so, I fully expect that we will continue to read journals in print form and publish books in print form. I also think that there could be a range of other options that will allow us to do more with those forms. And I further think that we will almost certainly develop other narrative strategies for presenting our material strategies that work more effectively in non-print forms, in digital media. I don't know what those forms are. When I took this job, I thought that it would be fairly easy to create you know, digital versions of William Mary quarterly essays that did the same thing the quarterly essays do in terms of presenting primary source research that's historiographically engaged. And I discovered it's actually very difficult, and there actually aren't a lot of models of people who are doing truly new things with the article or with the book form yet. I do think that's coming. But I also think, getting back to what I said about Chicken Little, I also think that there is something to be said, and in fact, something very important to be said for long-form scholarship, for the ability of an author to spend 10 or 15,000 words for a journal article or 100 or 200,000 words for a book, developing the fruits of her research, talking about its implications, allowing people to, for a history book, to come into the past in a very meaningful way and to emerge with insights about the past and about their relationship to the past. And I don't think we're going to lose the need for that sort of work. And I do think that that's going to be presented in something very much like a book and very much like an article, even 25 years out. I just think that there will be other possibilities as well. You told us that the William & Mary Quarterly is really for anyone who enjoys and has a strong interest in early American history. Would you give us a sneak preview of some of the articles you have forthcoming in the quarterly? Let me first talk about October. October is built around four essays. One focuses on an early American con man. Another is looking at grave robbing. A third is looking at essentially why the Declaration of Independence mentions Indians as a particular threat. And the author ties that mention of Indians back to sort of a longstanding tradition in British thought about the nature of Irish people and the Highland Scots. And the final essay in October is focused on what the author is calling the seventh key ship. It's focused on the 
the ship that didn't show up for the Boston Tea Party, and she's looking at the ship that wrecked on Cape Cod just before the Tea Party, and the tea was salvaged and it was brought ashore. And so suddenly, you know, in Massachusetts in 1773, we have something that didn't happen anywhere else in North America. We have this tea landing and being distributed to people, and the author is investigating what that means for these people and how they deal with this tea and what this means for all of us as we try to understand where the American Revolution comes from. So I'm very excited about October's issue. January's issue is going to focus, actually all the essays are about early American religion, which is not something I intended. It's just something that happened. But there's a forum on Quakers and sort of the lived politics of being a Quaker in early America. And the final article is about Puritans engagement with Indians. And this is not the Indians in Massachusetts, but this is Indians in India. It's about the Puritan perspective on Protestant missions in India. So it's really a global early American history. I think that's going to be a spectacular piece. All of those articles sound like really interesting reads. How can we subscribe to the William & Mary Quarterly so that we can read them too? If you want to subscribe to the William & Mary Quarterly, and I urge you to do so, what you need to do is become an associate of the Omaha Institute. And this is the institute that publishes the journal. And it's very easy to do. You just go to our website, and that's O-I-E-A-H-C. Dot wm dot edu. And you'll find information there on joining the associates. The associates membership starts, I think, at $75 for a year and you get the journal and you get a discount on the books that we publish. And most importantly, you get to support early American history and then the process of doing the sort of scholarship that we all appreciate. I'll include a link to the OI website and the associates membership page in the show notes and in the Ben Franklin's World app. Josh, Where is the best place to look for more information about you and how we can contact you if we still have questions about the William & Mary Quarterly or publication opportunities for our writing about history? The website that you're going to link to has everything you need to know about submitting to the journal, you know, our submission guidelines and all of that. It also has my email address. It's J-A-T-I-K-E-R at W-M dot E-D-U. And if you have a question about the journal, if you have an interest in submitting to the journal, if you'd like to know more about what we do, just email me. You know, I love talking about the journal, as you've probably discovered, and I'm very interested in being in touch with people who might want to write for it or who are appreciative about what we publish or concerned about what we publish. So please just feel free to reach out and email me. Joshua Piker, thank you so much for taking us behind the scenes of how historians publish history, both with the William & Mary Quarterly and with other journals and books in general. My pleasure. Thank you for spending the time with me, Liz. This was great. Who are we writing for? It's clear from our conversation with Josh that if we want to publish our writing about history, we need to consider our audience. Are we writing for others who share a specialized interest? Do we want our research and ideas to reach as many people as possible? How much time have we put into conducting our research and reading our historical sources? The answers to these questions will lead us to who our audience is, how we will write about the history we've been researching, and where we can publish our work. As Josh noted, writing about our research takes a lot of time and effort, and spending numerous hours working on our projects can leave us blind to the ways that we might be able to better present them. This is why Josh seems so passionate about peer review and the work that he and Team Quarterly do. Peer Review offers historians a fresh set of eyes. It gives them the opportunity to receive honest, constructive, and expert feedback on their writing. And it's feedback that may help them hone their ideas and their presentation of them. The fact that historians and scholars of history participate in the peer review process highlights a common theme that has appeared in each one of our conversations about how historians do history. From finding and researching a topic to writing and publishing about it, Doing history is a collaborative process. You can find information about Josh, the William and Mary Quarterly, plus links to Kirsten Fisher's blog post in your Ben Franklin's World app and on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 105. You should really check out the OI Reader. Not only does this app allow you to subscribe to and read issues of the William and Mary Quarterly, it's also a really cool tool that scholars are using to create new types of immersive reading and learning experiences. The app is free and available for both your iOS and Android tablets. And when you download and install the app, you'll find that the OI has included two free issues for you to read, enjoy, and play around with. The first issue is called OpenWMQ. When you open that issue, you will find the OI's first attempts to help scholars integrate different types of digital media into their text articles. And the music and interactive exhibits in these articles really enhances how we learn about history. 
The second issue is called Open WMQ Volume 2, and this issue contains six of the top 10 most downloaded William & Mary Quarterly articles, including the article we discussed with our friend Jennifer Morgan in episode 70. Plus, you'll definitely want to download the app, as YoA has also promised to upload Kirsten Fisher's article, Vitalism in Early America, Elihu Palmer's Radical Religion in the Early Republic, so we can read and enjoy it for free. To download the app, search OI Reader in your favorite app store, or click on the link in your Ben Franklin's World app, or on the show notes page. Finally, how do you want to read about and experience historical scholarship in the future? I mean, how do you want technology to immerse you in the past? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.